Good morning. I greet you in Christ's name this morning. I invite your attention to James, fourth chapter this morning. And this morning we're going to look at what it means to live and serve in a fallen world, and at the same time, not becoming part of that world. The title of my sermon this morning is In the World, But Not of the World. Let's read the text, James 4, starting at verse 1 to 8. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. You spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he, gi- but he gives more grace, therefore it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So James starts out here by calling out the church for their, their fights and their quarrels amongst each other. He addresses the issue, is it not your passions that are at war within you? So there's, there's fight and there's, there's conflict in the church here. And the passion, the, the word used passion in the Greek is hedone, and it's, it's the same word used in hedonism. And hedonism is the doctrine where pleasure and happiness is the sole or the chief good in your life. So these, member are, these members are, are seeking self-pleasure, and generally that type of pleasure is at the expense of another person. And we see that in verse 2 even to the point of murder. And then they ask, and they do not receive, verse 3. These members are asking things of God, but do not receive because they are asking in a selfish and with impure motives. And it's these selfish motives that are building up to the main issue of discussion here, and we see that in verse 4. You adulterous people... Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Friendship here in the Greek is philia, and it's a fondness, and it's an intimate fondness that we see here. This person has a deep and intentional relationship with the world. If you become a friend of the world, you're divorcing your relationship with God. Making yourself an enemy of God, it says here, and that's that's a big deal. I invite you to turn now to John 17. We're going to be taking a look at this passage. It relates well to chapter 4 here in James. So what does it mean to be in the world but not of the world? And in this passage, we see Christ praying for his disciples. And I think you could uh, interject yourself and myself in this prayer as well. John 17, starting at verse 13. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world." just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Verse 14 tells us that the world is going to hate us, and it doesn't say that we have 
uh, a say in the matter. That is going to happen, and that is happening. The world hates us as Christians. But Christ prays at the end of, uh, end of 15 that God keep us from the evil one. Christ acknowledges that we need help in this world. We need help in the battle against the evil one. So he offers that prayer of protection for us. But notice that Christ specifically prayed that God not take us out of the world. Christ was very clear to the Father to leave us in the fight. He does not throw in the towel to stop the fight. He leaves us in the fight. You know, we can, we can think of ourselves as, as separating ourselves from the world. We could do like a monk and we could go off into some far off mountain or cave secluded from any kind of indoctrination from the world to protect ourselves. But we've got another problem. We've got a sinful heart and a sinful mind that we would have to contend with that's just as wicked and deceiving as the direct contact with the world. Christ also gives us a great commission that calls us to go into the world. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In order to make disciples of nations, we're going to have to rub shoulders with people of different nations and different types of people of, of all kinds. We exist to bring honor and glory to God, and one of the ways we do that is through evangelism. So we've talked about being called to live in the world, but how do we live in the world and not become part of the world? We as a church have recently formed a covenant and in that covenant, we come together in agreement to hold line, hold the line on certain issues, a line of separation from the world. And we don't claim that our covenant is ordained by God, but it is a way of protecting ourselves from the world. We've come to agreement on certain things. If we're going to live in a sinful world, we need to be proactive and we need to draw a line in the sand and say, this is where we stop. We will go no farther with a participation in the world. So we live in the world, but separate ourselves from the world. What is the world then? What is worldly? Scripture gives us some, some, some clear lines on, on some of the bigger issues, but there's still some gray areas that uh, we as churches, we battle with. And these gray areas need discernment. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rattle off some things here that may be uh, worldly for some, but maybe not for others. And you don't have to answer these. Is Facebook worldly? Is a fancy car worldly? Is a theme park worldly? Are movies worldly? Are sports worldly? Is talk radio worldly? Is Christmas worldly? And Christmas is a good example of worldliness. I know some of you are thinking, why did you have to drag Christmas into this? But Christmas is a good example because the world has taken something. They have taken the, the, you know, the sanctity of Christ coming to earth and his birth, and they've turned it into everything but that. Uh, and the big thing now is, is trying to have Christmas and not say Christmas. Uh, Christ's in that word. We don't like that. So they say happy holidays instead. And I got to look, and you know what, you know what holiday means? Holiday means holy day. So when somebody asks you happy holidays, you say it is a holy day today, or this Christmas, Christ was born. That was free. A couple of weeks ago, I went with the youth to a theme park that was listed on my list of things here. And I love riding a roller coaster more than Rob Mullet loves riding roller coasters. <laughs> so therefore, I'm not going to say that a roller coaster is worldly because I enjoy it that much. Sometimes we determine whether or not something is worldly if it interferes with our desires. It is automatically not worldly if it's something we partake of. We need to be careful of that. 
So what makes anything worldly? When you take something you enjoy, whether that's a theme park or as simple as a cup of coffee, and you allow that thing to take the place of God, it becomes worldly. That thing you replace God with takes preeminence in your life. It becomes something that consumes your mind. You know, I can, I can skip my devotions this morning, but heaven forbid I skip that cup of coffee. It's that kind of, of mentality of replacing God with other trivial things. And a lot of what makes things worldly is the intentions you have behind that. When we prioritize these gray area things in life ahead of God, we have made those things worldly. Women, if you dress in a way that displays your body, instead of dressing in a way that covers your body, you have made dress a worldly thing. Men, if you go out and buy a new truck, not because of that truck serves you well, that it gets you from A to B, but that truck keeps you in line with the Joneses and puts you on the totem pole of status quo, you've made that truck a worldly thing. I can take something that in itself is not worldly and make it a worldly thing through my sinful flesh. Back to the theme parks. When we were young, uh, we used to We were in private school, so uh, the public schools were still in when the theme parks were were, were beginning. So we would go to Six Flags in Maryland, and it was halfway between my cousins who lived in Delaware. We would meet, and we would hit the theme park for the day. And if you had asked this 12-year-old boy if he was having fun, he'd have said it was the best day of his life. We were riding those rides, and some of the times you could stay on the ride because the park wasn't full, and you could just keep going around on this roller coaster, just stay on the thing. I think my cousin rode the one 20 times in a row without getting off. We were having a blast, and so we went out of the park for lunch because it was expensive, so we saved some money like any good Mennonite would do. And we were having lunch, and I don't even think we chewed our food. We couldn't wait to get back in there and get on these rides. And I overheard my Uncle Mark uh, talking to my Aunt Polly, and he he was saying, you know, I I really feel the urge just to stay behind. Um, I feel the urge to pray and and to study. He was a pastor, and I imagine he had a sermon on his mind. And I was thinking, how in the world could you miss out on all this fun and stay back and pray? And that's a perfect example of being in the world but not of the world. You're willing to sacrifice something for the sake of God. Loving your Lord more than you're loving the world and anything the world has to offer. And my uncle may not have been missing out on as much as this 12-year-old boy thought he was, but he was still missing out on on good time with his family. But instead, he he spent that time to to have a little talk with, with Jesus. How many times in our lives are we so consumed with the things of the world that we forget why we're here in the first place? And that's to glorify God the Father. 1 John 2, 15 through 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all this is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desire, but whoever does the will of the God abides forever. John says that those who have a love and a desire for the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Some examples we see in scripture of those who have turned from the faith to follow the world, and one one was Demas, and we don't hear a whole lot of Demas, but Demas was with Paul, Uh, when he was imprisoned, and Paul entrusted him, but he forsook the faith, unfortunately. And we read in in 2 Timothy 4, 9, Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. 
Thessalonica was a large, wealthy, cosmopolitan city, so Demas could very easily fulfill his desires there at the city. And I kind of imagine Demas seeing Paul. Here's Paul who has served Christ so faithfully all of his life, and what has he got in return? Suffering, persecution. And when he was forsook by Demas, he was actually on his way to death. He was on death row. Demas wasn't willing to consider the cost to follow Christ. And we can see kind of how Paul was feeling when he was writing to Timothy, do your best to come to me soon. I'm sure he, he felt forsaken by a good friend and needed some, some help and some companionship. We can also look at Lot. Lot was given the choice to choose land when him and, and Moses' flocks were becoming too big for each other. They had to part. And the land he chose was the Jordan Valley. And we read in Genesis, Abraham settled, settled in the land of Cana, while Lot settled along the, among the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. So he longed to look for a better land and pastures and the pleasures that the city brought in Sodom. No man of God could live among the, the people of Sodom. They were wicked people. But, but Lot was drawn to that. And we also see Lot's wife, when they were leaving, her love for, for Sodom was so great that she actually risked turning back and seeing what she was losing and turning into a pillar of salt. It cost her her life. So what's an indication that we are part of the world? One of the ways is you give in to the devil's subtle schemes of course, nothing that we individually do is worldly, right? Or we like to think that way. It's always the other guy who's, who's worldly. If a Christian today is challenged about his involvement with the world, this is a frequent response you will get. I have freedom in Christ to do this, whatever he's doing. Don't be a legalist. And preachers are scared to preach on this topic in fear of being framed for the very same thing, being framed a legalist. First Peter speaks well into this. First Peter 2.16, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of, as servants of God, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. In other words, don't use the phrase, I have freedom in Christ to live an ungodly lifestyle. Some people will say Christ did away with the old law. And by the way they live, he did away with obedience to his word as well. Tolerance. Tolerance is another subtle way. Satan is working his way into the church. You know, now we live in this, this woke culture, and woke is being, becoming awakened to the injustices to minority groups in the world, particularly, particularly radical pre racial prejudice and discrimination. And the chirp, church is lapping this stuff up. For the sake of looking tolerant and non-discriminatory, the church accepts these movements. Every last one of these movements have directly and openly attacked God and his word. You see what Satan is doing here? He's taking something that everybody can rally around. Racism. Everybody agrees that racism is, is a bad thing. And he takes that, he makes a movement, and then dishes it back to the church. And the church accepts it with open arms. They don't point out the flaws. They don't point out that they're against the family, the structure of the family, the way his God has ordained marriage and the family structure. They tear that to shreds, but they have a little bit of good in there that Satan knows they will take, and they take the bait. They accept the whole thing in one shot. And for the sake of tolerance and fear, they allow these movements to desecrate the church of God. Paul Harvey read a, a bit back in the 60s 
It's called If I Were the Devil. And it's a writing of how the devil would take the United States. In mind, this was written in 1965. And, and listen to how a lot of these things have come true today and how they're playing out in the world. This was 57 years ago. If I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness. And if I had a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I've seized the ripest apple on the tree, the... So I'd set out, however necessary, to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper as, as I whisper to Eve, do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that he wasn't as bad, he wasn't, he was, I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old I would pray, I would teach to pray after me, our father, which art in Washington. And then I'd get organized. I'd educate Arthur's how to make lurid literature exciting and that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves, until each, is turned, each in turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions. Just let those run wild until before you knew it, you'd have a job have a drug-sniffing dog and metal detector at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing. I'd have judges promoting pornography. Soon, I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schools, and then from the House of Congress. And in his own church, I would substitute psychology for religion and defy science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who want until I have killed the incentive of the ambitious. And what do you bet? I could get the whole state to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against work, uh, extremes and hard work and patriotism and moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old fashioned, that swinging is more fun that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus, I could undress you in public and I could lure you into bed for disease for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he is doing. John 15, 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. If you are loved by the world, there is a good indication that you are one of them. Why? Because the verse tells us that they love their own. But Christ called us out of the world, and that is why we are hated. As Christians living in obedience to God, we are constantly swimming upstream while the world is flowing against us. In review, how do we live in the world but not of the world? We surround ourselves with the brotherhood of believers. We set boundaries as church and we hold each other accountable. We don't use our freedom, we don't abuse our freedoms in Christ. We are not of the world, just as Christ is not of the world in John 17. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. You know, we all have sanctified hearts, but each one of those sanctified hearts is encased with an unsanctified worldly flesh. And that flesh has a desire to be a part of the world. 
Let's keep our wicked flesh from the place where it feels most at home, and that's in the world, and seek the world that is yet to come. Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I'd like to close in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 4. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Let's have a song.